Oh, look at that. Who's that? It's Sarah as a licensed tour guide. That's right. I'm gonna try to keep it consolidated because there's a lot to cover here in Central Park and we're gonna cover as much as we can. But if you want a more extensive tour of Central Park, my tour company actually can do that for you. It's called Funky Experiences. I'll put the link below. We'll just do an overview today. You may think Central Park is the last remaining authentic piece of the island of Manhattan, but it couldn't be further from the truth. Central Park is entirely man-made, but that doesn't make it not special. In fact, when Calvert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted first designed this park, they considered it their best single piece of art they've ever made and a museum without walls. And so today I wanted to bring you through some of the most amazing things you can see here in Central Park and talk a little bit about the history, the fun things you can't miss, and some really cool things you may not even know that you can do here. Like pigeons, there's a lot of pigeons. Don't feed them, they're really disgusting. We call them uh, flying rats here. But it's funny because like a lot of visitors think that they are some like majestic bird. They're really dirty. Don't touch them. Get out of here. I recommend if you're gonna do the route that I'm gonna do in this video, you should start at Fifth Avenue and 59th Street. There's different gates in Central Park and they're all named after themes of work. So enter through that one and you will come to this beautiful site and this is called The Pond. I know, revolutionary name, right? So one of the things you'll notice as you walk through Central Park is how naturally beautiful it is, even though it's not really natural. Now the reason it looks as gorgeous as it does is because it was actually modeled off of paintings of various places around the world. A lot of them were inspired by European paintings. And so that's why as you walk through, it just almost feels like you're in this magical oasis. Feels like you've truly walked into a painting and that's what Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox actually designed. The other thing that they did here is when they first designed Central Park, traveling around the world was something that a lot of wealthy people would do. And so they wanted to give that opportunity to those that live in New York. Fun fact. This pond, when it was originally opened, uh, they had a lot of pressure to create like different experiences. And so they actually used to have swan boats that would float in the pond and you could go in. And that was until like 1920. You could also once ice skate on this pond, but today it's very rare that the pond actually freezes. As you walk through Central Park, you'll notice that there are a lot of streets that are curving all different directions. Most of these are pedestrian paths. And one of the design elements of the park that was really monumental at the time was that they wanted to mix all different types of economic classes together purposely by creating these pedestrian paths. The park was always free. It was a way that children could come and experience the wilderness because they didn't really have that here in the city. And so you see a lot of that inside the park. You'll also find these larger roads. Now, these roads were never meant for cars because you have to remember that Central Park did start getting designed in 1858. So the park is quite old. They were originally designed for horse-drawn carriages and it was considered something that the wealthy would do, you know, take a, a stroll through the countryside and their beautiful horse-drawn carriage. But of course, if you live in New York City, you're not really gonna have a countryside. And so when Calvert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted designed the park, they factored that into it by making these horse-drawn carriage trails. And today you can actually do that. We're at one of my favorite photo spots in Central Park. That is this giant rock here that overlooks Billionaire's Row and the Woolman Ice Ring. So right down here, you have what they call is the woman ice rink. They also do all different types of things depending on the type of year. Like in the summer, they did this roller rink. It was like a disco. It was really, really cool. They will probably switch this over to an ice rink by the end of October. And that's where you're going to get that like iconic Central Park ice skating vibe. And on the other side of rock is this beautiful building. This is called the Dairy and this was constructed in 1870. It was meant as a house for women to get milk for their kids. They also had some farm animals in this area, but then in the later 1800s, the corrupt Tweed administration turned it into a fast food restaurant, and it remained a fast food restaurant until 1950. And today it is, um, doesn't really function as much, actually. I don't even know if there's anything inside. Maybe we should see. You put it in and out here, right? Oh, it looks like you can actually go in there right now. Let's see what's inside. I bet it's some Central Park Visitor Center. That's my guess. Let's see if I'm right. Ooh, that's fun. 
Oh, look at this. Oh my God, it's a Central Park gift shop. The Dairy's Now gift shop. That's an upgrade from a fast food restaurant, I think. All right, so we're gonna do a little loop back to see the zoo because there is a zoo here. And on your way, there is a native meadow here. This was intentional. All of these designs were not random. When the park was actually first commissioned in 1858, this entire land was practically unusable. And that's due to the Revolutionary War, actually. There's this very strong bedrock right under the ground in New York and there was barely any soil above it because of all the damage that was done during the Revolutionary War. And so they had to bring in all of this soil and when Calvervox and Frederick Law Olmsted designed the park, they factored in fields of meadows. There's actually three different types of designs that they went with. One was meadows because that is a key part of natural landscapes. The other one was a more formal design, which we'll see a little bit later. And the third type of design was a more more picturesque style, which is what you get with all the beautiful bridges. That's what we saw earlier at the pond. And so here we have the beautiful meadow or the pasture land, as they called it. There's a lot of butterflies here. They actually have a butterfly garden in Central Park and tons of squirrels, which I know you Australians are very excited to see. So if you want to see some squirrels, definitely come to Central Park. For those of you that are not from Australia, did you know there are no squirrels in Australia at all? I was shocked when I learned this news as a tour guide. Look at all these beautiful seating areas that they have throughout the place. That's because they really want you to sit and enjoy life here. This is a place where you're supposed to have calm, serenity, and not remember that you're in the city. And so it's actually hard to see buildings. See how they have all these rocks sticking out of the ground? The only thing that hasn't changed in Central Park are the rocks. So they had to build all the design around that. And this is pretty much how the park looked before they added all the soil in and made it this beautiful design. It was just like rocks. Actually, one described it as looking like the crater of the moon. We just finished walking down that beautiful meadow, turned the corner, and now we are here at the Tish Zoo. There's actually two zoos you could say in Central Park, although if you buy the ticket to one, you get the ticket to the other. So one is the Tish Children's Zoo and one is the Central Park Zoo. When the park opened, a lot of gifts were given from all over the world. France, Italy, you name it, all over the place. And one thing kept being gifted that really surprised the founders and that was live animals. Now, Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox did not want to have a zoo here in Central Park, but they were gifted a bear cub, they were gifted deer, they were gifted all types of animals. And so in a way they were forced to have a zoo here. And that's actually how the zoo came to be. But talking specifically about the Tisch Children's Zoo, this is something that the designers wanted to include because they wanted city kids to have the experience that country kids have of feeding and petting farm animals. And so here at the Tish Children's Zoo, you can actually do that. It's a really fun experience. We've done it with Bella before. They have all the typical farm animals, goats, sheep, things like that. Then head over this way and we get to the Central Park Zoo. Before you enter the zoo, if you're coming from the direction that we are, that you will see the Delacorte clock. This was put here in 1965. It was donated by a philanthropist, George Delacorte. He loved the medieval clocks in Europe that had the little animals or whatever that would go around the clock. And that's exactly what happens. Every 30 minutes, this clock does a little children's tune and the animals move around in a circle. It's very very cute. And then underneath it, you have the children's theater, which is part of your ticket with the zoo. It does 4D movies. It's 4D, so things pop out and your chair moves. Behind me is the official Central Park Zoo. This is where you're going to find more exotic animals. You can actually see the seals for free right from outside. You do have to pay to come in here. It's like 20 bucks, I think. They also have leopards, they have bears. Bear was the first animal that was donated and it was taken care of by uh, a young boy in the 1800s. Isn't that safe? I'm sure that would happen today. They're like, oh, a bear cub? Let's put a child to take care of that. And then on this side is the arsenal, which was originally designed to hold military equipment, but that a purpose never came to be. Today, the arsenal is actually the head of New York City's Parks and Recreations Department, but 
Fun fact, it was the park's first museum and the original headquarters of the Museum of Natural History starting 1869. This was built in 1851, so it's the only thing that really predates the park as far as an architectural piece, and that's because it was originally used as a military headquarters. However, Calvert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted did use this as their office as they were designing the park, so it has a lot of interesting history here. Today, there's really not much inside. However, there is a public bathroom in here. And that alone is a real gem here in Central Park. I'm here at the Balto statue, which is one of the most loved statues in Central Park. This is near the entrance of 67th Street and 5th Avenue. It's special because it's the only statue where the dog was present to see it unveiled. Historically, the rule has been you can't get a statue in Central Park unless you've been dead at least five years. Let me tell you why Balto is special. So he's an Alaskan Husky. Back in 1925, there was a really bad snowstorm and the people of Nome, Alaska needed a toxin serum called diphtheria. There was a bad sickness going around and they needed this serum and Balto led a team of Alaskan Huskies through the most treacherous weather. They couldn't even get anything to the people of Nome, Alaska on car, plane, none of that. This was the only way to do it and he led them through the storm and saved the people of Nome, Alaska. And it was such a big deal back then that they actually made this statue dedicated to him. Pretty cool dog. Turns out that when he was there for the unveiling of his statue, he literally did not care and he got into a fight with other dogs. <laughs> you can actually find him stuffed in a museum now. All right, let's head this way to by far the most famous part in Central Park. You're gonna love this. Central Park? It actually is the most central part for a reason. Okay, let me not fall here. Welcome to the mall. By far, this is the most iconic place in Central Park. It's been featured in so many movies. This is a place you must, must, must visit. It's called the mall based on an old English game called Paul Mall, which was played on a long straight line. They would knock a ball. Eventually the word mall came to mean a long straight path because of it. And you can see that is essentially what this is. Now, when Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox designed Central Park, they designed the best parts of the park to be only accessible by foot. And there was a reason for that. They assumed that the wealthy would stay on their horse-drawn carriage trails, and in order to integrate society with the wealthy, the poor, all different socioeconomic classes, they wanted people to mix, and so they put the best parts only accessible by foot so that people had to. It was really a social experiment that ended up working out really nicely. On the lower part of the mall, you'll see different sculptures of different literary figures. This is called the Literary Wall. And as you go along, you'll see different people. One of my favorites, we have Susan B. Anthony, which by the way, is my great, great, great aunt, which is pretty exciting. So I love having like that little connection. That's very cool. Now, as you walk along this area, you may feel almost like a religious feeling. And that is not an accident. This was designed to feel almost like a cathedral. Along the walk are the largest collection of American elm trees in the United States. Uh, back in the day, American elms were almost completely wiped out by a disease, but this has the, the most in the entire country still remaining. They're beautifully tall and they almost encircle the top like a cathedral. And when the, the light shines through them, it creates a similar effect as stained glass coming through the tops of a cathedral. And that's really the impression that the designers wanted you to have to be wowed, to be amazed, and to feel at peace here in the park. To the side of the mall, you see the sheep's meadow. It's called that because there was actually once sheep there. But over the ages, they took the sheep out and it became kind of like a meeting point for friends, family, even protests. They had a lot of Vietnam War protests over there. However, in modern day, that's the spot you go to meet your friends, grab a picnic blanket, some Frisbees, some food, drinks, and you hang out there on a beautiful 
summer day. At the end of the mall, you have this spot. This is called the Concert Grounds. And if we're keeping with that like cathedral theme, you could think of this as the choir loft because that's kind of what it is. This is the musical area of Central Park. And here we have area where you have live music. Um, this has been up since 1923. Originally, there was a different one that was a bit smaller. It was more of a pa pagoda type style. But here you've had iconic performers like Duke Ellington. You even had Martin Luther King speak here. We also did the memorial of John Lennon here. Um, he was actually shot like very short distance away. And there's another memorial called Strawberry Fields in Central Park where, you know, whenever you go there, there's different people playing Beatles songs. But my favorite, favorite part of the mall is yet to come. And that is right up this way. So follow me. Now, one of the things you'll notice um, as you're in the musical area are the benches are a bit different. And that was actually designed for a strategic purpose. So we have these beautiful American elm trees. And when they started having all these musical performances here, they noticed that people were trampling over the roots and killing the trees. And so Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox designed these benches to actually double as a fence. Here is the Bethesda Terrace. This is considered Calvert Vox's biggest architectural achievement, although it hasn't really been noted as a monumental architectural piece. And a lot of people believe that it's actually just because it doesn't really have a roof. But there's been so many things that have been filmed here. The final scene in Avengers was filmed here. Uh, scenes from Gossip Girl were filmed here. But just in Central Park in a whole, more movies have been filmed here than anywhere else on the planet. So it's just a special place. Going with that theme of the cathedral, uh, God, um, they considered nature and God to be one one thing and the connection between that. So there's a lot of different symbols of that throughout the piece. So once you enter, the first thing you'll see uh, on either side, there are sculptures representing different times of day. So this side is representing the morning. You have the sun rising over here. You have a rooster here. What does the poop smell symbolize? I don't think it always smells like poop though. There are horses, but there's also bathrooms here. And fun fact, the stalls are very strange. They like go up to here. So as you're like doing your business, you can like, if you stand up, you like see everyone else's heads. It's weird. I don't know why, like did like, were people smaller when they designed this? Like, I don't know what's going on. So on this side, we have night symbolized with an owl and a like book that's religion. Bible. And then on this side, there's actually a few debates on what exactly this means. It's, it reminds me of Halloween personally, but they think it may have some reference to Celtic origins. Regardless, it's pretty cool. Let's go down inside and see the stunning Bethesda Terrace once you get inside. There's often people singing live music. A lot of people get married here. A lot of people propose here. That's what it's supposed to feel like. It's supposed to feel like the center of the cathedral. Good note, Lucas. Yes, it's it's all that symbolism relating to, you know, a higher power. As you walk down the Bethesda Terrace, you will enter the Bethesda Arcade, which could have been a dark, creepy crypt, but a man named Mold put together this beautiful design. This is Stunning. It's representative of Moorish Spain, again going with that theme of like traveling the world without leaving New York City. On the ceiling, that is really what makes this a shimmering jewel of Central Park, it is the only example of minted ceiling tiles in the entire world. Most of the time you see this on walls or on the floor, but this is the only one on the planet and it's absolutely stunning. And one thing I love about this area is that you always have people singing and because of the way this is designed, it's kind of like an amphitheater, so it really accentuates the voice. Here we have the Bethesda Fountain. Now in the movie, Fools Rush In, Matthew Perry says, there's a spot in the middle of Central Park, and if you sit there long enough, the entire city walks by. He's referring to this, the Bethesda Fountain. This was designed by Emma Stebbins. She was the first woman to be commissioned in the entire city to make a public sculpture. Now this is supposed to symbolize the healing powers of water. And it was inspired by the great 
fountains in Rome, and you really get that. Now, Emma actually lived in Rome for 15 years, so it's to be assumed that she got a lot of her inspiration from that. And if you chose instead of walking through the Bethesda Arcade and you walk down the stairs, Take a quick look at the sculptures on the sides of each of the pillars because they represent different times of year. So this one is representative of autumn. Wait, this, that's a reindeer. Yeah, so like the ducks flying south for the winter, like this is representative of autumn. Here, this is winter, cause they'll, you know, like there's no leaves on the trees and there's the birds. I would think a snowflake would be better. I agree. But then over here, we have summer and spring. And don't even fight me on this one, Lucas, because this is clearly summer. The fall and winter are a bit confusing, but this is clearly summer. It's all botanical inspiration um, and you know natural nature related elements because of the park. Bumblebees for summer, hey. And we got, and what else do we got? We got roses because the flowers are blooming. The roses are, like it's a board. dove, I don't know. Here we have some butterflies. Right. Yes, okay. and, and, and what else do we have here? This is clearly spring when the birds lay their eggs. Well, they're already hatching. Oh yeah, one is, you're right. <laughs> Behind the Bethesda fountain is the lake. And although you may think, hey, isn't water blue? False, it's lime green. I don't know why. It's an algae, I think, so don't drink it. Uh, even though the Bethesda fountain's like, the water's safe. Well, yeah, okay. That's if it came from the reservoir. This water is a different story. Now this lake was not originally like a requirement of the plan when Calvert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted designed the park, but the park commissioners were like, you know what would be a really good idea? If we had a place that people could ice skate during the winter. And so they said, whatever you design, make sure that there's some body of water that can be frozen over eventually. But Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox decided that it would be nice to have a lake here. And that's because it creates the illusion of a larger space. And the way they form this lake, it's not just a circle. It's like kind of like a moving organism type situation. And that's so it seems like it's larger than it is. So it seems like you're looking in a cove and there's a larger lake right around the corner. Now, as you can see, you could rent a boat to row. It's like 30 bucks-ish um, to rent. And then when you return it safely, you get $20 back. Yeah, I know. So interesting point about that. The reason there's no fence here is because when this lake was originally designed, people could pull their boat up and get off at any point. They have multiple points where you could back in the day, like get off your boat, but no longer that's the case. There's only one place you can do that. And that is where you rent the boats right over here. So you have to like rent them there. You can go all throughout the lake and then bring it back. I have a fun fact. This is a true story. So my friend had a birthday party here. This was years ago. And she decided, wouldn't it be fun if all of us got in rowboats and row out into the Central Park Lake while drinking? What could possibly go wrong? Well, we may have accidentally sunk a boat and they had to rescue us, I swear to God. One of my friends had to choose between her phone, her work phone falling in the water or her Louis Vuitton bag and she went for the Louis Vuitton bag. Now look over to this side, you have the low boathouse. This was originally designed by Calvert Vox in 1874, but they recreated it later on and it became a restaurant today. It is no longer a restaurant right now, but they are planning on making it a restaurant again. And it was originally a boathouse, but the restaurant, even though it's called low boathouse, technically it's it's just like the name of the restaurant. So you don't actually rent the boats from the low boathouse. You rent it from the boat rental thing, which is right next to it. You can put it in and out here. You're right. This could be their opportunity. If you follow the side path along the Bethesda Terrace, you'll come here to the Bow Bridge, which is the second oldest cast iron bridge in America and was not originally part of the design of Central Park. However, it's called the Bow Bridge because its shape is similar to the bow of an archer, like an archer's bow, you know what I mean? It's absolutely beautiful. It has different um, botanical creations in a series of urns that are on the sides of it and it changes seasonally. So right now it's like 
summer, autumn, it's like we're in transition mode and that's what they got going on here. But depending on when you come, this will be completely different. We are going to one last spot in this video and it is right after the Bow Bridge. It's called the Rambles. It is shaped like a confusing, chaotic mess and it is designed to be like that. You immediately know when you're in the rambles because you say, where did I go? What is going on? I'm confused and I don't hear or see the city at all. Like you start rambling. Yeah, because you start rambling. You're like, what is happening? That is the rambles. It's very easy to get lost here. And that is on purpose because when they designed it, they wanted to have an area that felt like you were hiking through nature and that you kind of got, like lost a sense of time and place. And that's here, as you can see. Now along the rambles, as you walk through it, there are caves, there are coves, there are bridges, there is everything. This is also a great spot for bird watching and uh, it's a great spot for a photo shoot. In fact, one of my favorite photo shoot locations is right off the side of the Rambles and it's right here. It gives you a great view of the lake and this beautiful building here. You can see they already know the photo shoot spot right here. And with that, I wish I could bring you along further. There is so much to see in Central Park. I could literally make this video an hour long and still not accomplish it all. So if you want a full tour of Central Park, I, then I recommend booking one in person. You'll get much more detailed, a more immersive experience. And all of that can be booked via Funky Experiences right here. If you're coming to New York, check out this video next on scams you need to watch out for because some of them are in Central Park. Yikes. See you next time.